Uh, oh, it got, it got quiet. Is that because I'm standing up here? Oh, cool. Wow. Uh, that's great. Uh, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, we have a great plenary uh, in store for you. Uh, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, tickets are available for tonight's reception on the roof. Probably won't rain. Uh, they'll be available at the door if you want to come up. Uh, it'd be great. There's local food and um, very nice views. Um, also, the trolley tour, there are tickets available for that. Um, you show up at the trolley. Just go to the trolley. You pay money, but, but then there are tickets available. So trolley tour of DC sounds very nice. All right. Everybody okay? Okay. I can't see folks, so uh, everybody's okay though, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. So I have the pleasure of introducing our plenary speaker for uh, this afternoon. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, David, De David Cash with us. Uh, David is a dean and associate professor uh, in the John W. McCormick uh, Grad School of Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, he has expertise in science and policy, energy and environmental policy. Um, he has degrees from Harvard University, uh, Lewis and Clark uh, Graduate School of Professional Development, and also from Yale University. Uh, he has a PhD in public policy from Harvard, and his work has been concentrated there on um, environmental and natural resources. Um, he was also a middle and high school teacher, developing curriculum and teaching earth science, biology, chemistry, and environmental science. Uh, so he has a real passion for teaching, uh, and uh, we're going to hear a little about that today. Um, but we're also going to hear about some of his work in energy and environmental policy. Um, one of the things he did is help transform uh, the Massachusetts Commonwealth's energy and environmental policy uh, regulatory landscape. Uh, he, he's held senior positions in the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Devar Department of Public Utilities, and Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, so, yeah, he's published numerous articles and book chapters and is the re recipient of a number of awards from the US EPA, Environmental League of Massachusetts, Harvard University, Institute for the Study of World Politics, uh, Howard Hughes Foundation, Earthwatch, and the Environmental Leadership Program. So, I want to welcome David. Thank you very much. Mel, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I will say um, I've been a little anxious about being here just because, uh, as Mel said, I had been a classroom teacher uh, in middle school and high school, which, by the way, was by far the hardest job I've ever had, including senior positions in government where you have a governor who's mad at you about something. Way worse to have middle school students mad at you uh, and governors, as you can know. Also taught at the university uh, level, but when I was first asked to speak here, I was incredibly excited because uh, the importance of science education has always been part of who I am. And then the linkage of science and science education to policy and decision making in the public realm has also been something that I've been very um, excited about. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you again for, uh, for inviting me. And I look forward to Q&A uh, toward the end of this session. I also want to give a really quick uh, shout out to Arthur Eisencraft, a, a professor at UMass Boston. He and I, I think, are the only two UMass Boston folks here today. Arthur's done incredible work on, on making science education more accessible to the broad swath of students that uh, should be exposed to science. Uh, so it's great uh, that you're here. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to, to start. I'm going to cover a wide range of topics, and I want to do this through a variety of different kinds of stories. And uh, the first story is uh, from when I was a, a, a middle school teacher, as many of you do. First of all, actually, I'd, I'd love to know how many of you here are uh, elementary school science? Probably not a whole lot. OK. How about like middle school and high school? OK, good chunk. And uh, college and university? And how many of you are not like classroom educators, but science education is important? OK, so we're going to have to be careful about why I talk about administrators <laughs> here. OK, so uh, I was always very uh, interested in uh, when, I, when I got the bug to teach science, which, by the way, it was uh, after I graduated from college, I hitchhiked around the West uh, for a while. 
uh, much to the chagrin of my parents. And I ended up at this ranch in Eastern Oregon. And uh, it was owned by these two former teachers, one who had been a science teacher in the, in the Portland Public Schools, had been there for 35 years, salt of the earth, incredible guy. And I was so taken uh, by him and how he thought about the importance of science education. Um, and I had been thinking about this already, but he really inspired me. And he inspired me in ways that uh, I knew that I wanted to make science exciting for students and interesting and engaging, not about rote memory, but about things that the students would remember and be part, feel like they were part of their lives. So I always tried to do that in the classroom. And, and the first story um, is, um, is from, uh, I can't even remember what unit what it is. I'm sure it was about chemical reactions or something like that. And you, you know, I'm sure most of you know this kind of, because I, I remember doing it when I was in eighth grade, where you take zinc and hydrochloric acid and you put it together and then you see the hydrogen bubbling up and you capture it in a test tube. So that's the first reaction. And the second reaction is you light it and, uh, and, and you get, I remember getting this like little Right, it pops, the, the tube pops. And when I became a teacher, I was like, okay, that's kind of exciting. Like you see things bubble, okay, and you hear this little boop. But I was like, can't, can't I do this more, in a more exciting way? And so like, okay, what's bigger than a test tube? Like a two liter soda bottle. <laughs> that could be pretty awesome. So, uh, so I set this thing up in the, in the classroom, right in the middle table. Fortunately, I had them wearing goggles. And I took a two liter soda bottle, put it upside down on a ring stand and ran the reaction under it, filled it with hydrogen, and, and then lit it. <laughs> there was such a loud bang. The, the rocket shot up, smashed into, you know, it's like one of those ceilings that has, uh, you know, those tiles on it. The tiles shattered. There's like dust falling down. The students are like this. Silence. Yay, Mr. Cash! Yay! It was like the best thing they had seen. It was like, oh, they were so excited. Um, and I really, I, I was hoping when the principal came in to do my uh, visit, like he wasn't going to look up at the tile and ask what had happened there. Um, okay, so that was one story, realizing like you got to be where the students are. And of course, students love explosions. So that, that, that's one story. Another story, it won't be quite as exciting, but I was always interested in understanding this overlap of science and uh, decision making and policy making. And you'll hear this theme throughout my talk. And it's actually, uh, I, I hate to say this, it's going to be a critique of the field. It's going to be a critique of how science is taught, K-12, and even in universities where there isn't as much an embrace of, uh, of the understanding that science happens in a political, values-based, social construct. And in that context, if you don't understand that, that's at your peril. And I'll talk a little bit of where that peril has happened um, in real life. So I tried to figure out ways to engage students in something that might interest them. Um, and uh, it w I was shocked. I started this in, in middle school, and I developed all of these role plays. And the role plays, uh, when I look back, I, by the way, I, I dug these out of my files the, as I was preparing for this. Uh, I still save them. You know, they're printed on dot matrix printers. And I cut, literally cut and paste. For those of you who are young, that's like a scissor. And then you glue it on a piece of paper. Uh, cut it, cut these things together where I made these very intense role plays where the class was split up into six different roles. Uh, one of my favorites was on whether or not wolves should be reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park. This was in the early 90s, so they had not yet been introduced. It was a big topic of debate in Congress at the time and in state houses all over the country. And, you know, huge, you know, the American Farm Bureau and the American Ranchers Association all weighed in on this and the Environmental Defense Fund. I mean, it was a big battle. And so I split the students in into six different roles. There were some who were farmers and ranchers and environmentalists and senators. And we spent like, th this is all we did were three weeks. They researched the topic and the culmination was a Senate hearing in which each, each group and the senators were in this kind of mock hearing. Um, and at the end, what they did was wrote, I had a huge list of places they could write, both to express their opinion, so to to so see how they were empowered by understanding ecology and economics, et cetera. And they was going to write to expre express their opinion to one of hundreds of different organizations and senators and Congress people and their state houses, um, and then also request new information. So remember, this was pre-internet, so I couldn't just Google things. So this became a kind of 
self-iterative process where every year when you know, I had 150 kids, we'd get then 150 new packets of information from all of these different organizations that I could then cut and paste for next year's. Um, and it, it was just, it, it was an incredibly powerful way that I thought students could really get engaged and understand. And um, I had people who asked me, wait, you do this with eighth graders? They get into this? And they totally did. And they totally understood bias. And they uh, totally understood the realm of politics. They were not surprised when senators from Wyoming would write back and say, well, they didn't do the science correctly this way because they ignored this, this, and this, and this, which were actually very good statements about how the science had been done at that time. Um, and so the, it, was, it, was a, it was a way for them to see what happens, what was, what's happening outside the classroom that could connect to science. And I did these role plays on energy, on uh, both nuclear energy and hydro, uh, and on a whole range of different topics. So that's, that's story, uh, story number two. Uh, let's hold on a sec. Okay. The other is uh, a, a, another story where um, I often did summer trainings, like uh, many teachers do. And uh, I was, at the time, I was teaching the Amherst Public Schools. So this is in the kind of middle uh, to western part of Massachusetts. Uh, and there are five colleges in, the, in that area, UMass and Amherst and Mount Holyoke and Smith and Hampshire College. And they combined to do these kind of teachings. And in this particular one, I was with a bunch of my peer science teachers, middle school science teachers, and we went up to Greenfield Community College, which had this really hands-on, interesting simulation of the space shuttle. And the idea was that the space, you know, everybody who participated in this, and this was geared for students, but the teachers were doing it, um, everybody who participated had a different job or role. You know, there was the commander and the co-commander, and then there was the engineer who, who deployed the shuttle. And um, when, when we started learning about this, and we had like this huge three-ring binder that said step one, step two, step three. And in my mind, I was like, oh my God, this is so boring. This is like all we're doing is like a video game without the fun of like, you know, King Kong coming. It's just like step one, step two, a video would show and, you know, step three, engineer, deploy the satellite, satellite deploys, you know, mm, it was kind of boring. So if you're getting a sense, I'm a little bit of a troublemaker. Um, so my friend and I, who I was teaching with, were like, this, this doesn't work. How about my friend who was the engineer and there were a little bit too many people in the group, I was like, how about I'll be a media person? Right? NASA would send up a media person like to write about this fantastic shuttle thing. And we were like, okay, great, let's do that. And then what we did was we crafted this top, top secret memo. By the way, the satellite that was being deployed was like to monitor the oceans or something like that. You know, some nice environmental purpose. And so this memo was a top, top secret stolen memo. I think at the time the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was Colin Powell, so it was signed by him. And it basically said that this was actually not a environmental uh, uh, satellite. What it was going to be was it was going to be helped to deploy Star Wars, you know, to, to missile defense or something, or missile, but it was probably worse, missile offense. Uh, I know somebody just hissed like, oh God, how, I can't believe this guy did this. If he was in my class, I'd be really mad. And um, so what we did in the middle of this, when it came to step three, deploy the satellite, my friend Norm you know, went to the commander and said, commander, I just got this, I, 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 the, the media guy showed me this memo and I'm not here to deploy a military satellite. I'm here to deploy an environmental satellite and I'm not gonna deploy it. And um, you know, we were kind of like, well, what's gonna happen? We can have cool conversations about the role of science and policy, right? Well, no, everybody got so pissed. You know, they didn't get to do steps six, seven, eight, nine. And of course, the, everyone who was in, the, in it didn't know that we had done this. They just thought this was part of it. And like this pandemonium on the shuttle, which made me think I will never be an astronaut because if that's pandemonium just from teachers being there, I don't know what happens when something really dangerous happens. But you know, they stop the simulation, the two professors come on board, and they are just pissed as could be because we've ruined their simulation. And they were really mad at us and like no amount of debrief and explaining why we did this. I mean, they know they were not on board and I could totally see why. I could totally understand why they were upset and I get where they were coming from. Um, and it also made the point that we were hoping to make like, wait, science and policy and values all intersect. And then, um, uh, two days later, uh, we got a call from our principal. We didn't have emails back then. Got a call from the principal, could we come into the office? And we came to the office, and this guy was like this 300 pound ex Marine who people didn't want to mess with. And uh, he said, Oh, I, I just got this call from the Five College Partnership. What's going on here? 
and will like be explained, everything, just like I explained it to you. And uh, it's like, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it was interesting because the professors, like I said, who ran this were really upset with us. Two years later, I met one of them at a conference, and he said, you know what, I know we were really pissed at you back then, but you really made us look, again, how we did this simulation, both from the perspective of like just rote memory and follow step A through Z, how that doesn't create the kind of thinking that we want science students to think, and that there's always an intersection of science and values and policy. So um, that was, you know, that felt great after that, and it's, I still kind of see that as one of the kind of highlights of my career of kind of pushing that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so that's, that's, on, uh, that's in the classroom teaching. I will say, I'm not gonna dive into it, but when I uh, finished my PhD at Harvard, I stayed for three more years and ended up designing um, the first year class for the new environmental science and public policy major. And I, it was all around, it wasn't using role plays, but it was all about this intersection of science and politics and how do you make decisions um, in the face of uncertainty, et cetera. I, I don't have any exciting stories uh, from there. Um, but that's, that, you know, that was a kind of natural progression for me. But again, in preparing for this, um, I, I have a friend uh, who's an assistant um, superintendent at a local um, public school district, and he was talking to me about the relatively new framework on, on science education, which has a lot in it about this first part. That is, you know, thinking about how to make science more exploratory and curiosity-based for students and project-based uh, where the students kind of lead exploration as opposed to step by step by step by step. That's exciting. But as the bottom shows, there's still, I, you know, this is a 380-page document. And there's so much language in it that implies that science happens in a bubble. That questioning, which is good, and critique, which is good, all happens like peer to peer, scientist to scientist, as if that's where the most important or even the only conversations happen. And it didn't say anything about what if your research is being laughed at uh, at a political rally what if uh, a, a chairperson of a Senate committee on science and technology is raking your work over the coals and you're being questioned in that kind of way? Or what if, like the letters that I got, got back from my students, what if there's a senator in Wyoming that says, yeah, your ecology research might be great, but you ignored the economic dimensions of this for the ranchers and for the tourism industry. Go back and do research on that. None of that is in that, and I think that does a huge disservice, not only to what science really is and how it's actually done, but for any of these students that want to, to engage with science later in their, in their lives. Now certainly, there's certainly fields and there's certainly parts of science where, that, where it is the case, where it, it is insular, and that makes sense. But I think so much of what may excite students about science is that it has application in a world that they see all around them. Um, so that, that, that's a, a, you know, kind of a, a critique that I think would be worth continuing to explore. Uh, okay, so when I ended up at Harvard to do my research, um, I kept this interest in the role of science in public policy. And I, was, um, I, I tried to choose a topic that I could really dig into, how does science get leveraged in a situation that's complicated, that's dynamic over time, that is values-based, and I ended up working out in the, uh, in the Great Plains in, um, in Kansas, Nebraska, and Texas. I was looking at water management. Some of you might know there's a large aquifer that's under the Great Plains uh, called the Ogallala Aquifer, and it's being depleted very rapidly. And this was a perfect test case because I could look at how science and water management intersected, but intersected across many levels, which is another one of my interests. Like, if something happens at the local scale, how, how does that interact with what's happening at the middle scale and an upper scale? And that's, you could say that about science too. So for, in this example, you have the US Geologic Survey. Each of those three states has a state geologic survey. And each of those states is linked into the agricultural extension system. So has uh, usually some kind of technical or scientific person who's at the county level. Um, and then each water management district may or may not have various technical expertise. So it was, a, it was a great case study to look at how these interactions happen, both between science and management, science and decision making, and science across scales. And um, 
And by the way, I looked at this. Um, we had a whole team of researchers that were looking at these kinds of questions across, across the globe about El Nino forecasting, for example, or agriculture in Mexico, how new technologies come out. And um, you know, I, I, in some ways, it seems like it's not a huge surprise. But in those places where there was more of a divorce from the science and the management, then management decisions weren't made as well. Um, and sometimes that divorce was because science was housed in a place where there was little avenue for that conversation. And some of that happened because, uh, because managers did not want to have connections with science, right? Um, and um, so w one of the frameworks that came out of this was, the, was demonstrated in this. And by the way, I will say, I know this, is, this might be kind of hokey. You might know something wearing cowboy boots. And um, when I was in uh, Amarillo, Texas, you know, a lot of the farmers wear boots like this. These are ropers, they're just, they're semi, semi work boots. And I remember going into a, a store there to get boots because, you know, what's cooler than like a Northeast guy having cowboy boots, right? <laughs> but I really, I, I bought these and I thought I should, I should even wear them for dress shoes. And part of the reason is because I felt as a researcher, I always wanted to be connected to like people on the ground. That's where my, what, what I want my research to represent. And these always remind me of that. In fact, I was once, when I worked for, um, in, in government, in state government, uh, I worked for Governor Patrick, Deval Patrick for eight years, and Governor Romney for two years. I'm gonna keep coming to that point that I've worked for both Democratic and Republican governors, and I've worked with Democratic and Republican uh, uh, um, administrations at the federal level as well. But I was in a, uh, in a cabinet meeting with him and I'm sitting on the side because I was like a second bencher. I was not a first bencher. And he's talking, 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 and he looks over at me and I'm like sitting there, so I guess you could see my boots. And he stops talking to everybody and looks at me. He's like, are those cowboy boots? <laughs> yes, sir, they are. Thanks, they look good. <laughs> that was it. I didn't go through the whole spiel of why I wear them. That would've been out of line. Okay, so what's this about? I think one of the dangers of science, and particularly scientists that want their work to be used in the public context or in decision making in general, is that we think a lot, science thinks a lot about credibility, right? We have peer review, we have journals, we have associations, we have many, many, many rules by which the credibility of the scientific enterprise can be established. Really important. And I think that's when people say, you know, oh, I did this great study, it was in science, how come it's not being used? How come it's not making a difference? And the two other pieces we think from the research that we've done shows that you can't ignore these two other pieces. That is, are you asking questions that your target decision maker, your policy maker, your senator, the president, a CEO of a company cares about? Or are you asking a question that's curiosity driven because of the field that you're in, which is fine, really important to ask those kinds of questions. But if you want to make a difference, it's going to have to, you're going to have to take into account whether the questions that you're asking are salient to the decision maker. And again, I saw this all the time in, uh, in the Ogallala example, where farmers care about particular kinds of things about irrigation that a hydrologist at USGS might not know about or, or have cared about. And if you don't ask the questions that the farmer is curious about and wants to know something about in terms of irrigation, et cetera, then, you're, then your model isn't gonna be helpful or your findings aren't gonna be helpful. And by the way, the agricultural extension system is set up to solve that problem, right? So there's a county agent who knows the farmers. In fact, maybe he's from a family that farmed. And so when the farmer comes to the agent and says, hey, there's this new mold on my corn, I don't know what to do about it. Well, the agent has credibility, salience, and I'll get to legitimacy with the farmer, and then can bring it all the way up to the line to researchers who can study this new mold, come up with a solution, and there's like this re excuse me, really interesting iteration that happens back and forth. So that's salience. Ask the question that decision makers care about. And the third is, I think, probably the most complicated and perhaps uh, the most controversial, which is the process has to be seen as legitimate to the people who you care about. It has to be seen as transparent or inclusive. And um, I think there's so many times where efforts are made uh, to, to push the ball forward with really good scientific research, but the process is seen as black boxy or not engaging with the community. I remember, uh, again, different group of USGS scientists who are in the LA area who were like, ah, oh, we're having the hardest time 
um, you know, show, having our models make a difference with people, how they save water, how residents save water. And we just started asking a bunch of questions. Oh, well, like, have you, did you sit down with the, the main community groups so they could help you scope your research and your modeling? No. Did you, did you like, in the middle of it, test what some of your findings were? No. We had a community meeting after our research to show them what our research was. And, you know, again, maybe their research was great. But the community was left there like, wait, who are these federal scientists coming in tell us, telling us that we have to conserve water? We didn't even know about this process. So that would be seen as, a not, as not scoring very well on legitimacy. Now, the little words in the bottom right, to whom, really important, have to think about their multiple audiences. And the key is figuring out what the balance is amongst all of the players. And you're not going to, it's not ever going to be perfect. And there are going to be trade-offs, right? That's the biggest fear, one of the biggest fears scientists have is if I engage with that community group, will that somehow taint my credibility? Will that reduce how credible my work is? Will it be seen as political, what I'm doing, right? And so, yeah, there are trade-offs that have to be managed. And again, there are institutions to manage those trade-offs. Again, you can think of the ag extension system as one of those where you have brokers in the middle, county extension agents, et cetera, who might broker and try to ward off uh, the scientists from getting uh, politicized in that kind of dynamic. So this is the kind of framework that, um, that we developed um, when, I was in, uh, when I was in graduate school. And then I got a job in state government. And I actually thought, you know, I, I, I doubt this stuff is going to be, I'm going to need to use this stuff. My mother is probably the only person who read my papers anyway. And, um, and I found that that was not, uh, not true at all. And, um, and as I worked longer and longer in state government, I realized that this framework was incredibly helpful for the kind of job that I had. And that job was, at, I was a first a policy director, so sort of on the front lines for the governor on whether it was climate change or fisheries or salamanders or forestry, advising him and his staff and my boss, the, the secretary on, uh, on matters that could relate to science. Um, and then I was later a commissioner for the Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Public Utilities, where scientific and technical information is used all the time. And we used, and we need it to advance our policy agenda. So the fishery story is gonna be um, an, a story of failure. Um, and I'm a big proponent, by the way, of, of the importance of failure, because you just learn incredibly much. And I think it was actually uh, uh, you know, my uh, two daughters that really taught me that, um, because as a parent, I want to protect them from failure. And then I realized like, when they failed, it was awesome <laughs> for them. They, uh, ultimately, they <laughs> don't realize that now. OK, so, uh, so as many of you might know, New England fisheries is a real cluster fish of you know, difficult economic, social, cultural, historical kind of, I mean, there, there have been fishing industries in New England, uh, uh, well, certainly with the native peoples, but then when Europeans came over as well. And this is a picture from the New, England, from, uh, the New Bedford Standard Times. The guy on the left is Governor Patrick, the guy on the right was the mayor of New Bedford. And it wasn't until months and months, actually it wasn't until many years later when I was designing a talk on fisheries that I dug this picture out of the New Bedford Times um, thing. And, and there's me in the right. See that, that, that guy over in the right? That was me, it was kind of like, wow, there I am. What a bureaucrat sitting there with my whatever portfolio or whatever. But what, these, these trips were always exciting for me because I got to, be, I got to see how the fishing industry and their families dealt with the problems that they were facing. And uh, you know, I was, I'd be at town meetings where I'd be c confronted by the 70-year-old Portuguese woman who, uh, por Portuguese by descent woman who, this was the first time this next year where their children were not gonna be able to take over the fishing industry from their father's grandfather, great-great-grandfather, right? And that, how devastating that was for the community. So real life implications for this. Two, like the patently absurd, on this trip, uh, we were taken on a tour of a cod fishing boat. And fortunately, it was just me, the governor, the governor's media guy, and this guy whose name was the Cod Father. I kid you not. He had the largest fleet in New England of cod boats. And we go up into, uh, into the pilot, um, pilot house, and he's talking to the yak and to the governor. I'm just like kind of behind the governor. And, uh, and he says, he mentions the name of the chief scientist in the National Marine Fisheries Service office that's nearby. And he says something like, I'd love to see her six feet under. I know, right? And it's like he's talking to the governor. And fortunately, there were no newspapers there or anything like that. 
Well, it just turns out, in case any of you are following the news, he was um, indicted and convicted on all kinds of racketeering charges, and he's in jail right now. So, as far as I know, none for murder, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so what, what, what we were thinking during, during all of this uh, devastating economic stuff was instead of just throwing uh, money at the community, which was happening all the time uh, from the federal government, let's get a monitoring system that the fishing industry trusts. Right, because every year, National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMFS, would come out with their cod monitoring and assessment, and it would show the population was dying, and the fishing boats would say, no way, no way, I go out here, I catch a ton, or I go out here, and there are plenty of them, and they wouldn't trust them. There was no trust of the scientific endeavor, and so the reg to regulate in that kind of situation is really hard. So we thought, how about we get a chunk of funding from NOAA, and we established, since the state a relatively honest broker for the fishing industry and for the National Marine Fisheries Service. We had a very good relationship with, some of us did, in the state government. Um, and uh, let's establish this collaborative monitoring and assessment program where f fishing boats would be part of the data collection. They'd be, sit at the table to scope how we would do these kinds of things. In my mind, it was going to be the solution to the long-term problem, decades problem, that we had had. And that even if the cod population dropped and we had to regulate very strongly, they couldn't say, we don't trust your science. They wouldn't be able to say that. And um, unfortunately, after months and months of wrangling and negotiation, National Marine Fisheries Service did not give us the grant. And so what happened was predictable. So we reject they rejected the funds for this process. And then just these are headlines over the next couple, couple of years. Uh, the assumptions used to mandate annual catch limits were not risk neutral, but were in many cases risk adverse. Okay, so some values are in the science that we don't like. Fishing data, it's, uh, it's what it is, except when it's not. You know, uh, doubts grow over the COD study. Council scientists question data. Fish assessments usually don't get yield, get yield right, says study. State targets NOAA science, tactics. Uh, you know, where's the fish, still now, 2014, not now. Where's the fisherman on the review panel? Fish, they're not even on the scientific panel. Something fishy in the quotas. So it's, it's uh, you know, you, uh, we knew this was going to happen. Exactly because whoever made the final decision said, credibility is really great in these studies. And we don't care that much about the legitimacy of the process or, or, the, or the salience. And actually, it could be argued credibility would be better too. Because you'd have different kinds of expertise in the fishing boats who could ask the kinds of questions, ask for data that a fishery scientist might not be able to get. So that was one example of uh, failure where we didn't get to do, uh, where, where, where that balance between credibility, science, and legitimacy was not struck. One that I'm most proud of is how we rolled out our clean energy and climate plan. So a law was passed in Massachusetts uh, that required us to do all kinds of things, but one of them was to do this plan. And instead of, as many states had done, uh, do this in like six months with your staff, maybe have a couple of public meetings. We had almost a two-year process. We had an advisory committee that was pulled from uh, the environmental groups, from the business community, from municipalities. We hired an impeccable consulting firm that was best known for working with the fossil fuel industry. They were good economics and energy system modelers. Um, and then we just held meetings after meetings, working groups that the staff from all the aforementioned groups were involved in the working groups. So that by the time this plan came out in 2020, uh, in 2010, the uh, end of 2010 after two years, um, we almost got no pushback, no pushback at all from the business community, even from the fossil fuel generators, uh, because I, we, we, we bent over backwards to make sure that we were asking the right questions and that the process was totally transparent, understandable, et cetera. And it's still, this, is, this has enough staying power that after Governor Patrick left and a Republican governor has come in, Governor Baker, this is still the kind of framework. It's been updated, it gets updated, but it has not been rejected, has not been uh, you know, put, put in the dustbin. It's kind of been the, the, the foundation. And I credit that to the team of folks that assured that those three kinds of things, salience, credibility, and legitimacy were, were all met. Okay. I'm not going to go through that. That's like the take-home message. It builds trust. Um, I will say, decision options, when um, they're much less contested 
than in other, uh, when other processes are used. And when they are contested, it's contested about the merits, about the scientific pieces of it, or about the explicit pieces that are value-based. So you can imagine a conversation that would have happened about uh, risk aversion with the fisheries community where that would have been debated. And then you would have done two simulations, one in a very risk-averse world, one in a not risk-averse world. Uh, but that, wasn't, that, that, that did not happen. Um, and then the, the decisions that are ultimately laid, made, like the plan that I just said, are more robust. They're more robust to political changes or economic changes, in fact. Okay, so where are we now? Um, many have talked about the place that we are, they use terms like post-truth or post-fact. Um, and what are the implications for those of us engaged in the scientific endeavor? And are we in a moment now uh, with the federal government, with the Trump administration, where we are experiencing a qualitative change, so treating science completely differently, or is this a quantitative change? And like I said, one of the, the benefits of having worked uh, in uh, two different parties, with, in two different administrations, with two different administrations on the federal level, I've absolutely seen negotiations happen back and forth. When a new administration comes in, their values are different. Their goals are different. Their policy frameworks are different. So the scientific questions that they're going to ask, the assumptions that they're going to make, the policy goals they have are all going to be different. But not in none of those realms, working in the Romney administration, the Patrick administration, working with the Bush administration or the Obama administration, and at some point in the Clinton administration, in none of those did there seem to be a kind of wholesale uh, diminution of the scientific endeavor that I think we may be seeing now? And that raises, that raises a lot of concerns. Um, and here's one example. I was listening to a podcast last week on um, the International Treaty on Ozone Depletion that was done in the 80s, right? Ozone hole, big problem. CFCs cause it. Uh-oh, what are we going to do? And that was like it in a, in a nutshell. They, <laughs> And this is what the podcast uh, said. Uh, it, was, it, it just struck me. So he said, what happened next, meaning 1980-something, is almost unthinkable in a modern political context. And even today, it still sounds kind of crazy. But back in the 1980s, the US government, under a Republican administration, used the scientific discoveries to inform a coordinated international response. This was not just any Republican administration, this was Ronald Reagan, who embraced a philosophy of deregulation that is a sta that's standard now in the Republican Party. So again, both my experience and history has borne out that while there are debates about what's salient, what's legitimate, what's credible in a particular administration at a particular moment in time, there just hasn't seemed to be, uh, the, the, again, the kind of diminution of the whole scientific effort, I think as some evidence shows in the way. And here's just a, a couple of things. These are maybe small, but, and I'm not going to go through the entire list, but uh, it seems daunting to me. So these charts just show the red bars are the change in number of, so there are many, many, many scientific advisory committees within federal government. Every agency has them. They, you know, they're, they're, there are probably hundreds of them. And so these charts show changes when a new administration comes in. So the red bar shows the change in the number of meetings. Many of these me meetings are required by statute. You know, the Scientific Advisory Board for the EPA must meet quarterly, blah, 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 like something like that. And uh, so what the red bars show are the change in the number of meetings. In Bush, they went down by about 10%. Obama went up by about 5%. Trump, down by 20%. And then change in the number of members. So Bush stayed about even. Obama had a decrease, it looks like about 8%. Um, uh, Trump has had, you know, 15%. So big changes over over prior uh, over prior. Uh, another couple uh, another uh, a couple of examples are um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy started during the Ford administration, 1976. Um, we are now in the last two years the only time that there's never been either a director or an acting director. Um, and by the way, all of the directors, all the full-time directors in Republican, you know, Ford and Carter and Reagan and Bush and et cetera, et cetera, they've all been scientists and they've all been physicists, by the way. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, but now there's none. There, there's, there is no senior science advisor for the President of the United States, who, as we know, is dealing with a huge amount of technically important, scientifically challenging kinds of issues, whether it's denuclearization of the, of the Korean Peninsula or opioid addiction or, uh, or the new Ebola that's going to come. 
um, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no advisor. Um, and it's not just the number, and this will, I'll show in the middle, I, I, I want to show here how, uh, I'm sorry that you can't read this, but this is the EPA Scientific Advisory Board. Again, it's created by statute. Historically, it's been the pie on the left, and the light blue are academics. So that looks like it's 70 something percent, 76 percent or something like that. The yellow bar is from industry. The blue bars are from NGOs and, and government. So again, it's not just the numbers that I showed in the prior graph, but it's the type. So now the current EPA Scientific Advisory Board, the academics have been, you know, 20 percent have been cut out, they're about half now, and industry is about 25 percent. So it's been almost tripled the number of industry representatives. And okay, you know, if we think about, oops, sorry, if we think about things like um, uh, salience, credibility, and legitimacy, you know, one could argue we need more industry at the table. They'll ask the right salient questions. It has to be a legitimate process, and they, they should not be boxed out. Uh, but again, the standard has been what's on the, on the left. And so when we ask the question of to whom is something salient, legitimate, and credible, are we, is this a qualitative change, a quantitative change? Are those circles getting larger or smaller, um, depending on what the audience is that this administration is looking at? And when now we're in this, uh, you know, I could go through the, the list of the kind of appointments and positions that historically have been held by scientists that, are, that were appointed to, uh, and are not scientists. We could go through the many, many different kinds of regulatory changes, again, where there's some of that action when there's any change of administration, but here where we see a wholesale diminution of how science is used in the regulatory process. And this has, of course, um, caused many scientists to feel like the scientific endeavor is being attacked and therefore should go to the streets, something that's incredibly rare. I cannot remember a time where scientists, not, not you know, wanting to deal with climate change or something else, but scientists saying we need to protest about science itself. And uh, so, you know, nerdy scientists are very funny. So what do we want? Evidence-based research. When do we want it? After peer review. <laughs> they're just, they're hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a really interesting there were, I, at about the time that these protests were happening, I gave several talks um, in Arizona. I was invited to Arizona State University and University of Arizona to give these talks. And there was a huge debate within the scientific community. Do we attend these kind of political, these are clearly political rallies. Does that decrease our credibility if we do that? That was one of the big concerns. It was, it was, it was largely debated. And if I go back to this, to this, are we at a time where this is totally being wiped off, that this administration doesn't care about credibility, salience, legitimacy, it cares about a policy agenda and it will do what it can to get it done? Or can this framework maybe help us and think about, well, they're really leaning heavily on salience for the important political groups they have and not so much in credibility and legitimacy? I don't know. It's, it's something that I've been, um, you know, any academic who has a framework wants to say, oh my gosh, do I need to throw this framework out? And we should be really open to that. We should be, you know, we should say, oh, well, we're in a, an age where your framework doesn't work anymore and we should throw it out and think about something else. So I've been trying to think whether this makes sense or not. So I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I think there are big questions remaining on what the, uh, what's going to happen with science in our agencies, what's going to happen with science in, in academia, what's going to happen with scientists in academia who want to play a role. And, um, you know, I, I keep coming back to points, particularly in a group like this, of the value of science education and science literacy. And because at the end of the day, while I think things are really problematic right now for the role of science, I actually think that our fundamentals are still sound. I hope our fundamentals are still, still sound. I mean, if you go back to the writings of many of the founders, you know, they thought about university system. They thought about science in guiding good decision making. And it's sort of been a core, I think, of the American philosophy as it is in many different countries. And I think it's always been a core, whether you go back to some of the constitutions of, of uh, the 13 states, Massachusetts being one of them, that had uh, education firmly implanted in the constitution itself, to the, the, uh, the, the land grant act in the 1860s. 
uh, which if we get on this topic, it's like, I, I think if I had to choose one piece of legislation in the United States that's the best, it would be that. I think it's been so fundamental to knowledge and the use of knowledge in making good decisions in industry, in the public sector, et cetera. Um, so I think there's a really core, uh, core piece that, that is important here. And I think that we're not alone. Uh, this is a cool graphic, maybe some of you have seen it, where someone took, I don't know which years it is, probably the last three or four years, took scientific journal authorships, and if there was a paper that was written by multiple authors from different countries, they would draw a line. Right? So if, you're a, if, you're, if your colleague is in Italy and you're in the United States, there'd be a line from where your university is to the Italian university and vice versa. And there are a couple of things that are striking about this. One is there's a lot of international collaboration going on. And if that's the case, and if so uh, many corners of the world are leaning on the scientific endeavor uh, for, again, not just for the curiosity dimension, which is all, you know, so important, but for policy making and decision making, then you know, we're in this world that uh, no matter how much it's, no, no matter how much research funding is decreased or, or scientists are sidelined, it's ultimately not going to matter. That's one. The other is, by the way, the big dark spots, particularly in um, you know, Africa and parts of Asia and Southeast Asia, where there's still a huge amount to be done. No question about it. There's a huge possibilities for collaboration and building of universities and the research endeavor in those parts of the world as well. Um, and then the last, going back to uh, uh, literacy, is a quote from one of my favorite uh, citizen physicists, is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Science literacy is the artery through which the solutions of tomorrow's problems flow. I love that a, a physicist, an astrophysicist, is, is using a, a, a biology metaphor there. That's, um, so let me uh, stop on that note, and I'm happy to take questions. And can we, can we turn on the lights in general so I'm not blinded? I, I didn't realize this was Wait. going to be the right day to wear my March for Science t-shirt. Ah, there you go. Can you just introduce yourself, please? I, I'm Sonia Folletti. I'm a high school physics teacher in Alexandria. I live here in Washington, D.C., which makes it easy to March for Science. And, um, All I kinds actually of other things. spent a week earlier this month helping with the campaign of a scientist and engineer who's worked in clean energy, mm. who's campaigning for Congress. And so ah. I was wondering if you would comment on um, the, uh, the idea of scientists becoming members of Congress and whether you see any ways of persuading the folks in Congress who don't believe climate change is real. So uh, on the first question, I, that's easy. I think it's great. And I think it's great for a couple of reasons. Um, I think it's great in the same way that I actually think it's great that lawyers do. Um, and I think it would be great if there were uh, people who were uh, trained in various humanities that train you to be critical thinkers. Um, I think it's great. I think scientists bring to the table a way of thinking, a method of thinking about things and understanding realities in a way um, that's different than others. So having that voice at the table, I think, is, is really, really important. Um, so that's the first. I'm sorry, the second question was about? Uh, changing the minds of climate change denial. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, OK, there's a, there's a couple of pieces to that. And, uh, and I've certainly been part of that. I was, a couple of years ago, I was asked to testify in front of the House Science and Commerce Committee, um, and uh, it was shocking the kinds of questions that I got. I was I, I was shocked, and I was shocked not because of kind of political persuasion, but again this kind of question of where's evidence, you know, and um, and but I think the answer primarily the answer to that question relates to, um, if I can kind of stretch this, r relates to the exploding bottle that I talked about at the beginning, which is what my goal there was to make whatever we were doing important to or contextual to the audience, which was you know, the students there. And I think one of the failures in general in the environmental movement 
has been a really strong reliance in part, although it's changing quite dramatically, has been like on the kind of moral obligation. And people don't like to be told that they're immoral and the choices they're making are immoral, right? And I think the more that we think about climate change in dimensions that deniers uh, would be concerned about, and I'll just take one because there are many, but the economics of it, economics and economic opportunity. And um, I think the more it's framed in that kind of way, that we're at a point where um, the choices that we make about energy independence and, um, uh, and economic growth and innovation all point to a revolution in clean energy. And whether or not they believe or not in climate change won't matter. And one test of this is talk to the governors of Iowa and Kansas and Texas, I think all Republicans, where wind is growing faster than any part of the United States. And it's not because it's, it's addressing a climate issue. It's because it's growing jobs. It's making them more energy independent. And if you'll notice when I showed you the picture of the, the study, the report, it was not called the Climate Action Plan Report, which many states named theirs. Ours was called the Clean Energy and Climate Report. And that was very conscious because we wanted to frame the whole complex of issues around climate and energy in ways that, that people uh, would embrace. And I've always thought one kind of like side note on that, I've worked a lot on electric vehicles and things like that. And um, you know, you'll, we'll know, oh, and then I'll tell a good story about Governor Romney, because I mean, I, we have to tell good stories about Republicans in science as well, because they're out there. I mean, in fact, you know, prior to the last six or eight years, you know, scientific endeavor was a bipartisan thing, and in fact, environmental protection was as well. But we'll know that, that electric vehicles have made it when you see them in the drive-up line at Dunkin' Donuts, right? right? When it's not an issue of income and it's not, you know, I live in, in, in one of the most progressive cities uh, in Massachusetts, which is a progressive state, and of course you see Priuses all over the place and like, okay, we get a false sense of, wow, these kind of cars are making it. Well, no, they're not. So here's a quick story about uh, Governor Romney and about the importance of salience. So, um, we had an idea to push what's called a fee bait, terrible name, but it's essentially saying, let's take our sales tax and we'll do it on a sliding scale for cars. If you have a really energy efficient car, you'll get a really good, uh, a low sales tax or even a, a rebate. If you have a clunker of a car that you're trying to sell, you'll have to pay instead of 6.25%, you'll have to pay 12% or 15%, right? Send the right market signal. Romney actually loved this. It's a, it's a market-based incentive program, provides for innovation, the signals are there, it's all great. So we, we came to him and we showed him the model. And he said it has to be revenue neutral, right? We don't wanna have government getting more money than, you know, whatever. And um, so we showed him the model and it was actually pretty complex to figure out how the dynamics were gonna change. And he said, yeah, okay, this is nice and everything, but you know what? It's not fair. What you're doing here is you're really penalizing, for example, a large family that has a minivan, right? Because no minivans got rebates. No minivans, in fact, got, above, got less than what the regular uh, normal tax was because they all can't compete with four doors and with Priuses. He said, what I want you to do back, go is run these data, but give me three different buckets your regular four-door cars, minivans, and pickup trucks. Because what your model also does, it discriminates against uh, contractors, working people. Who are, and he was totally right. He was, uh, you know, we, we were like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is exactly right. But what w w part of this point fits in is we weren't asking the question he wanted to ask, right? And uh, so we went back, we did it, um, he loved it. We filed the, the, the legislation, which was pretty remarkable, and the democratically controlled House and Senate in the state shot it down because I don't think they wanted a victory for a Republican governor. But it was, it was a really good instance of kind of his grasp of technology and incentives and the importance of doing the kind of research that we were doing. Another question. I would like to Wait, make can you a, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Frank Locke. I was in the classroom teaching high school physics and chemistry for 36 years and right. recently working with uh, high school physics student teachers. Cool. Um, I want to make the observation that deregulation eliminates or reduces assessment and evaluation. 
and I'll say they, not to identify them politically, certainly want to evaluate and assess educators. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So you're saying that deregulation of what reduces evaluation? Businesses, deregula deregulation oh, yeah. in, in general is a okay. policy right now. Yep. And in, it goes in the opposite direction for educators. Oh, they I want to increase yeah, that's the assessment, assessment of us and evaluation. I mm -hmm. didn't think about that until you talked. Yeah. So you stimulated my thoughts. I appreciate it. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I don't know what to comment on that. It's a whole different kettle of fish of how teachers are dealt with in different, you know, state by state and even the federal government. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Come on, we have five minutes. We can get more than one in. <laughs> Hi, my name is Larry Gould. I'm at the University of Hartford. Uh, I noticed your comments about climate change. It's a very interesting issue. Yeah. I've been studying it for about 14 years. One of the things that I find, though, is that there's very little knowledge of the issues from both perspectives, that is the people who are pro-climate change and the people who find fault of it. Uh, for example, over the past 18 years or so, the models, and there are over about 100 models, mm -hmm. have predicted an increase in the temperature, we're only talking about tenths of a degrees, mm -hmm. uh, yet over the same 18 years or so, the observations of both satellite and radio sonda balloons indicate that there's been practically no change in the global mean temperature. Now when I say the, uh, I don't want to make a big speech, I just want to get this point across because I think it's important. Um, when one talks about has the climate uh, change stopped, there's a methodological issue here. Namely, to claim that something has stopped means that has, it has begun to begin with. It's sort of like, have you stopped beating your wife? That assumes that you've been beating your wife, okay? So the problem, the problem that I have with all of this stuff is that from what I've seen in the about the education of climate change, there is practically no knowledge that's out there in textbooks or otherwise concerning the problems with the claims about climate change being dangerous. And the 97% figure, by the way, it's not true. It's close to about 6 tenths of 1%. So there's a lot of uh, hanky-panky that's going on. And I think that teachers should be aware of and should look for themselves about what the issue is concerning climate change, whether it's dangerous or not, or whether it's natural or not. Thanks. So, okay, so I, I don't wanna dwell on this um, too much, but I, I, would, um, I, I would disagree with your first statement. And um, as someone who followed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for many years, although I admit I haven't read the most recent reports, my understanding of where the science stands is that the predictions that were made 20 years ago for the most part, across many different kinds of variables, whether it's sea level temperature, atmospheric temperature, whether it's glacial melt, whether it's early budding in trees, whether it's animal migration, all of these things are pointing in the direction that, you're, that, that you seem to be refuting. And it's that all of them have either been, uh, have either confirmed what the model said 20 years or are worse than what the model said 20 years ago. Now, I could be, you know, some of my details could be wrong. I would recommend that you go read the IPCC. But this is, it's not, it, it, I, I, again, I don't want to get into the details. But that, my understanding of where the science is, particularly on the credibility side, which of my understanding of how the whole IPP, IPCC was set up, how it works, its role in scientific communities, these, the, the data and the analyses that have been done are probably some of the most analyzed and subject to rigorous, credible peer review in any kind of large situation like this. Happy to talk more about that later if you'd like, but I think that's been a, um, uh, misstatements about that uh, have been rife. And this is a whole other conversation about how media approaches climate, saying, oh, well, if one scientist says it's happening, well, we have to get another one saying it's not happening. 
And you know, that's not how science doesn't work by voting. Other questions? Yes. Come on. So, one minute. One minute for one, one more question. Mel, Mel, can we get one more question? What's that? Another session starts. Another, okay. Another, I'm so sorry. Another session starting. Let's thank David again. Thank you very much. This was great. <laughs>